On Tech News Today, YouTube Gaming arrives, Verizon makes your dumb car smart, and a new trackpad could revolutionize the computer fondling industry. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, August 26th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin. Welcome to the show. Our co-anchor today is ZDNet contributing writer Kevin Toffel. Hey, Kevin, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good, Mike. I uh, actually made a new car purchase last night, and I had a little tech surprise that I will save for the end of the show. Or you could insert it into one of the two car-related stories we have, if relevant. Otherwise, hang on to it till the end. Uh, really interesting car tech news. But first, we have some very, very bad news. Uh, a TV journalist and her cameraman were murdered today on live TV, and the suspect posted the video of the entire incident on Twitter and Facebook. He reportedly shot himself on a local highway less than two hours ago and survived. He's now in custody. The shooter's video is framed in the style of a typical first-person shooter video game where you see the suspect's hand firing a pistol at the bottom of the screen, and I don't mean to imply that video games had anything to do with this. That's just how, how it looked. The shooting happened before 7 a.m. Virginia time, Reporter Allison Parker and cameraman Adam Ward were both in their 20s. The suspect's name, and he was in his 40s, was Vester Lee Flanagan, but he previously worked for the same TV station as a reporter under the name of Bryce Williams. His Twitter account showed tweets complaining about being unfairly treated by both victims at work, and he claimed that Parker had made a racist comment to him at some point. Posts on Williams' profiles were quickly removed by Twitter and Facebook. Kevin Tofel, this is a new event in the world of murder, I guess. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. the idea that someone would shoot other people while holding a phone in front of, between himself and the weapon, that's a new one as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean, a couple thoughts come to mind. This is a tragic, tragic story. It's terrible to hear. Um, I, I was really distraught when I heard it. And I don't know these newscasters and I don't live in Virginia, but... You know, with so many problems that we have in this country to, first of all, take out your anger on people if you've had a problem with them in the past or whatever in this way and then share it so publicly is just um, there's something wrong with that. And, and, you know, frankly, life isn't fair. That doesn't mean uh, we can just go about our business and do whatever it is we want. And then even worse, just, you know, publicly share this kind of thing on social networking. You know, I mean, Twitter and Facebook, and they've made it so easy to share these things. And I don't blame the social networks by any means. Um, it's obviously a personal choice that somebody made. Obviously, I disagree with it tremendously. Um, it, it's tr it's just tragic. It really is. And uh, it, it is also worth noting that both Facebook and Twitter very quickly removed the content. And I thought that was the right way to do it. I didn't see mm -hmm. Facebook. I didn't have a chance to go to Facebook and see what happened there. But on Twitter, they kept the account there and then removed all of the tweets. And so it wasn't like it was an error message of some kind saying, you know, this, this doesn't exist or whatever, because that would lead to confusion and, you know, it, do I just have the wrong, you know, Twitter name or whatever. They left it there, but then there was nothing in the tweet area. And I would say that's probably the best way to handle it, although folks who want to advocate for free, free speech and such may have an issue with that. I totally understand that perspective. Uh, I had seen some tweets about the, there's YouTube videos of it out. Um, people were not sharing the links with me. And frankly, I would not have clicked on it regardless because I, I just don't feel that it's right to even watch it. Yeah. I, and, and of course, Twitter, um, you know, is in a tight spot there because on the one hand, if they leave it up, then they could be mm -hmm. accused of profiting from a tragedy and if they take it down they can be accused of of censorship uh that's a tough call uh mm -hmm. in for, you know in my opinion twitter does a lot of things very right and a lot of things wrong in my opinion and this one is something that you can't you know there's no it's a no-win situation and i'm perfectly happy with them removing the the tweets that video is going to be out there for anybody who wants to find it um 
and Twitter is, you know, I think on balance, I guess I'll have to say that that's probably the best thing to do. So I would agree. I would agree. Right. Well, Google will launch its Twitch-like site called YouTube Gaming in less than an hour. YouTube Gaming is a dedicated site and website exclusively for gaming content and mostly for live streams. Jeffrey Grubb is a reporter for VentureBeats GamesBeat and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. Appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much. Now, can YouTube catch Twitch? I guess that's the big question. Now, we've heard some of the details about uh, YouTube gaming, but the big question is, are people who are into this sort of thing already locked into Twitch, or does the video game community on YouTube, uh, are, are they in the same ballpark as Twitch? Can you give us a sense of what this horse race looks like? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a horse race. Uh, YouTube has a chance here. They have an opportunity, and they're obviously taking it. Um, you know, most interestingly, YouTube and Google were considering purchasing Twitch, and they sort of fell out of that race, and Amazon picked them up instead. So they've been wanting to get into this live gaming video space for quite a while now, and there's good reason for it. There's going to be a lot of money in this space. Gaming video is huge, whether it's recorded or live. But whether or not YouTube can catch up to Twitch in the live space is going to be a big question. Um, people do have a lot of issues with both sites. Uh, Twitch has sort of had issues with... Uh, it, you know, it hasn't brought on everyone to make money. The partner program, you know, while huge, 11,000 people um, isn't near as much, much as what YouTube has. It's very easy to make money on YouTube. And people might be attracted to that, I think, specifically. But at the same time, YouTube has its own issues. Uh, specifically, I think someone today who's already said that they were live streaming on YouTube and that Content ID captured something and kicked off their live stream in the middle of the broadcast. People aren't going to be happy with that. And that could pose issues for Google trying to catch up. Yeah, Jeff, so is that how um, YouTube is going to flag non-gaming content? I mean, this is exclusive for gaming and such. So how does how does this get policed from a, a YouTube standpoint in terms of content? Well, Content ID will definitely capture things like if someone's trying to broadcast live TV shows, you know, if you you have the UFC thing and you want to broadcast that on YouTube gaming, they're going to catch that like that and that's going to be shut down and no one's going to have any problems with that. The problem is YouTube has been very much on the side of publishers. Um, Publishers and game and develop, game developers have often used the content ID uh, system to shut down videos on YouTube that say things about their games that they don't like. Uh, that's been a huge issue for people creating content, people who consume content. They don't like the idea that developers have that sort of control over YouTube. Uh, and it, there's no sign that that's going away. It seems like it's still an effect on the live streaming on YouTube, which is going to it's going to enrage a lot of people who are very vocal. And, you know, let's face it, gamers are very vocal. Now, what about people who want to use this for things other than gaming content? Let's say they want to see it as a kind of a meerkat uh, type of environment and just want to just talk about stuff has, that has nothing to do with gaming. Will they be shut down by YouTube? I, I don't think so. YouTube's had their sort of live streaming system in place. You know, you could do the Google Hangouts there. You can broadcast that stuff on there. Um, I think if you try to put that in the gaming channel, I think there's going to be some barriers there uh, just in the system itself. Uh, Google said very explicitly that uh, the YouTube gaming like algorithm itself will filter in any content that's gaming related, whether the person chooses to or not. So it seems like they have a system in place that knows whether or not you're playing a game and it'll just put that on gaming.youtube.com and the apps as well. So it seems like, and you know, I haven't used it much. I've played with it just a little bit today. Um, I'll play with it a little bit more tonight and probably know a little bit more, but it seems like people are going to, if they're not you know, broadcasting gaming stuff, there's gonna they're gonna be filtered into another part of YouTube, and that'll just be handled on the software side. So, Jeff, I've been uh, dealing with video games, playing them since the golden age of video gaming with the Ataris, the Intellivisions, ColecoVision, all the way up through today. Help me understand. I've watched Twitch a little bit on my Xbox. I haven't seen this yet, but um, what's the big attraction for people watching people play video games? What do you think? <laughs> You know, gaming's expensive. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it. Uh, there is something to be said about watching an entertaining person play a game that you can't afford right now. And, you know, if, if you know it's good because they're playing it, then maybe you pick it up down the line. But for now, you can still get that entertainment. Now, why someone prefers that over, you know, a high production movie or television show or Hulu or Netflix, I don't know if I have the answer for that. I'm, I'm 32. Maybe the generation just barely missed me, but I will say that I have had some really great experiences watching games online, uh, you know, specifically uh, the esports scene. Uh, competitive gaming is it's, it's growing and it's, it's enormous and it deserves to be because it is absolutely entertaining. Um, 
But beyond that, the PewDiePie guys, I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know if anyone does. Don't you think it would be super entertaining for an old guy who, like, maybe has a new <laughs> show to, like, be really bad at games and to be, like, flubbing his way and trying to figure out video games? Wouldn't that be hilarious? Mike, I have no idea who you're talking about, but I would laugh at it. That's for sure. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. I'm going to have at least one subscriber. Jeffrey Grubb is at VentureBeat.com and on Twitter at Jeff Grubb with two Bs. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jeff. Thanks for having me again, Mike. This is really fun. More news coming up, but first let's talk about Gazelle. Gazelle is the environmentally friendly way to buy and sell your used gadgets. And why is it environmentally friendly? Well, the reason is that smartphones are nasty, dirty things full of toxic chemicals. The manufacturing process is very environmentally unfriendly. There's no way around it. And so the only environmentally friendly smartphone is the one that is never manufactured in the first place. And by selling your device that's gathering dust in your house right now to Gazelle, and allowing Gazelle to find a happy home for that smartphone, that's a phone that that other person theoretically won't be buying brand new. And so the, the sharing of phones, the, the re recycling in back into circulation of smartphones uh, is the most environmentally friendly thing you can do with a smartphone other than never use one. And of course, that's never going to happen. So if you both buy and sell to and from Gazelle, You'll not only help the environment, you'll also get the latest and greatest devices. You'll get the best prices. You'll be able to buy more phone for the money that you have. And, of course, if you get a, you know, there's two classes of phones to buy from Gazelle. One is certified like new. That's just like a brand new phone. The other one is certified good, which has some visible signs of wear, but it has a great, great price and it'll work perfectly. So always buy and sell your devices to and from Gazelle. It's the place to buy and sell a smartphone, a tablet. They'll even buy your old iPod. You know what? They'll even buy some laptops. Check it out. Find out what your iPhone's worth. Take a minute and go to gazelle.com to find out. Well, Verizon launched a product today that, well, before we get into that story, actually, I have some breaking news. Facebook is getting into the virtual assistant business with a new product that's named or codenamed M, according to David Marcus, uh, who posted uh, this uh, post on Facebook very recently. It's basically a feature of Messenger where you basically message this assistant and you get uh, presumably Siri-like answers back. Again, we'll be going into that in uh, on Tech News tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific, so you can check in for more details about that story. Well, Verizon launched a product today that makes a dumb car smart. It's called Verizon Hum, and Verizon claims that it's compatible with most cars made within the last 20 years or so. Will Greenwald is a senior analyst on consumer electronics for PC Mag and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Will. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for coming on. Now, Verizon gave you a demo of the Hum. What is this Verizon Hum business and how does it work? Uh, the best parallel would be to OnStar, although focused a lot more towards diagnostics and car maintenance and security than sort of the concierge general purpose service that OnStar offers. It consists of a uh, speakerphone you plug in, you uh, put on your uh, dash the flip down visor and then that module that you plug into your car's diagnostic port which most cars today now have and it sort of pairs up and then lets you access uh, through an app uh, your car's status uh, the mileage it's been getting uh, you can contact roadside assistance there's a, a gps there's a gps uh, connected to it so you can find your car if it's stolen or have roadside assistance reach you like wherever you might break down on a highway. Uh, just a lot of useful uh, features for drivers, if not necessarily for like entertaining or trying to find stuff. There is, aren't really like any services of calling to make appointments at a restaurant or anything like that. It's just for taking care of your car. So it's interesting because it, it adds some basic connectivity to an older car. You don't have to have a newer car or anything like that. I'm assuming the device has some type of SIM card uh, that puts it on the Verizon network. I'm guessing also they're using their MTM network uh, to machine to machine network rather to get data from the car to them. Um, how does that all work? I mean, is there, did they go over the setup process with you and explain all that? Uh, yes, the uh, the device is registered to your specific car and after you plug it in, it connects automatically to the paired speakerphone device, which is Bluetooth enabled. And through that, the diagnostics module has an onboard GPS and, uh, GPS module and a, a cellular radio, which you can then use to call roadside assistance or emergency services and use to track your car's location. If you want to just make your own calls, you can then use your own paired uh, smartphone and just treat it as a standard clip-on 
uh, speakerphone device. Now, I you know do a lot of business travel and 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 also other types of travel. And a typical scenario will be that I'll drive to the to the big gigantic airport parking at SFO or LAX or someplace like that. I'll park. I'll you know go to the plane. I'll fly away. Uh, the vacation or the trip will completely erase my mind. And then I'll arrive exhausted at one o'clock in the morning to pick up my car. And I just kind of look at the whole parking garage and go, all right, uh, where is it? Uh, will this help me in that regard since it has GPS and also things like finding your car when it's stolen to kind of find my iPhone, but for your car? Uh, yeah, that's actually one of the more interesting parts of uh, the app that lets you connect to it through your smartphone. Uh, there's a parking feature which just tells you where the car is parked and lets you sort of track it by its built-in GPS from your phone and sort of walks you there. And if it's in a parking garage, like multi-level, you can put in notes or put in a photo of your space so you can know what floor it's on. And similarly, uh, if the car is stolen, the app has instructions. Uh, you should file a police report first, but after that, you can basically just give the report number to HUM and the customer people will coordinate with the police to make sure that the car gets found. So, Will, obviously this is a lot less expensive than going buying to buy a new connected car, uh, but really to take an old car and add this connectivity, what's the cost and availability? I'm assuming this is coming out soon. There's got to be a monthly subscription service. I don't know if there's a uh, an upfront fee. What are, what are the costs to actually add this to an older car? Uh, it's currently available or will be shipping soon directly from Verizon through their HUM website, and it will be $14.99 a month, and the equipment is actually included. And as a monthly fee, it's actually a little bit less than the OnStar fees that are comparable. Uh, for just roadside assistance, they have plans for $20, and OnStar's security tracking is $25. Uh, and OnStar can sort of scale up to additional features that are more general use and not diagnostics related. But this is an uh, economical alternative that you can connect to pretty much any recent car. And, uh, you know, this is that's a really good price. And, uh, you know, compared to OnStar, for example, uh, that is a really amazing price. But it's, this raises the mother of all first world problems, which is that, OK, I've already got an automatic device in that port. Now I got this other thing Like I got, you know, I need a hub that like <laughs> a splitter that gives me like multiple. I don't know. I don't know what people are going to do. First world problems. Well, Greenwald is a PCMag.com and on Twitter at AgroWill. A-G-G-R-O-W-I-L-L. -L. Thank you so much for joining us today, Will. Thanks for having me. All right, bye-bye. Well, here's a Kickstarter starter campaign for you. A Denver-based company called XTI is crowdfunding an airplane called the TriFan 600, which takes off and lands like a helicopter. Yeah, it's called the TriFan, and guess how many fans it has? Yeah, three. Graham Warwick is the managing editor for technology at Aviation Week and joins us now by phone. Oh, welcome to the show, Graham. Hi there. Now, can you tell us about the TriFan 600 uh, just as an airplane? Uh, what, what's different about this airplane? Well, what's different is that it takes off and lands vertically, which is kind of unique, <laughs> certainly for yeah. commercial aircraft. I mean, we know about the Harrier jump jet, but nobody's, other than helicopters, nobody's really ever done it in the civil side. This, uh, so this, this, that's what makes this unique. It's aimed at the business or executive market to to give what's called point-to-point -point travel so he'd be able to take off from his house fly to his office or her office um and avoid airports etc cetera, etc cetera, by taking off and landing vertically graham i suspect that the the big selling point here is not just that it's cool to have this this uh, vehicle that flies in the air goes straight up for, you know for takeoff and such but really it's probably to save time at the airport if you're an executive instead of spending one two hours at an airport um you're gonna you can just you know, take off and go. Is that the big selling point here? It, it is. I mean, you know, a lot of executives make use of, uh, of business aircraft at the moment, but you have to go to an airport uh, to get on your business aircraft. The business aircraft then takes you to an airport near to your destination. And you have to get a car to go to where you're going. Um, the, it, you, and when you're in the air, you're in the same sort of delays that you would do if you're in an, in an airliner. Um, so, and if you could, if you, you can go and use a helicopter, but helicopters don't, the range is relatively short, so they tend to be used for short trips. They're, as we all know, helicopters are not the quietest things and they are a bit, they vibrate a bit. So, so, I mean, you can use them for short range travel, but you do, you don't want to fly or you can't fly a long distance in a helicopter. So what this really does is sort of bridge that gap between a comfortable business jet that could fly you long distances very smoothly and quietly 
uh, and a helicopter that can take short distances, but you don't want to sit in for very long. This, this sits in that middle ground between the two. Now, what's the technology behind the controlling fans? I mean, I know from the history of the Harrier jet and the Osprey and also a lot of, uh, you know, inventors projects that tried to have multiple fans coordinating. It's a tricky uh, uh, um, engineering challenge because the slightest um, additional thrust by any of the fans can cause a you know, cause the whole thing to flip over, whatever. How is this controlled? Is this computer controlled? Are the fans computer controlled? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, you know, Dirty fans have been around for a long time, and I mean, and they have a couple of two or three big advantages over over jet engines or rotors. Because there's a duct around them, they're inherently safer than open rotors. You know, if it throws a blade, it doesn't it doesn't go where it shouldn't go. Um, it contains the noise of the rotor. And also, if you design it properly, you get a bit of extra lift from it. So, so, so people have liked duct rotors for a long time. Um, and there have been designs, if you go back, there's an X-plane back in the 50s that had four ducted rotors. Mm. On the, you know, it had two wings and it had two ducted rotors at the end of each wing. The trouble was complexity. Um, you needed an awful lot of, of rods and pulleys and other things like that to make the control system work because you were doing it all mechanically and it got very, very complicated. Well, obviously, nowadays, we have flyable wire control. Basically, whatever the pilot does goes to the computer, and then the computer decides what the airplane wants to do, and then it goes tells the airplane what to do to uh, accomplish what the pilot wants. So you can take all of that mechanical complexity and put it into software. So so what a, a couple of things they've done here is, for startup, there are only three fans. There are not four. They've decided to go for a, They can get the stability they want with just three, with the one tucked at the back and the two under the wings. Uh, two on the wings, and then they have them controlled uh, digitally by computer, so that you can do all the fancy stuff like you you, you vary the, the the speed and the thrust and the direction of the ducted fans to do all of the control. So you can do your pitch roll, etc., through the computer of just using the fans. So and then you don't have the complexity of having four fans to worry about. No. And then the the one in the back they cover up in in forward flight anyway. So. Now, just to follow up on that quickly, because I know Kevin has another question, but so are you saying that even during airplane-like flight, they're using the fans for, for the control of the pitch and yaw and all that kind of stuff? No, once, okay. once you tilt, because the fans tilt, when you take off, the fans are pointed upwards, so it, it, you know, so, so you use them in, 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 in thrust-borne flight. But when you're flying like a helicopter, you control the fan, the thrust of the fans to do all of the control. Once you're in forward flight, it flies like a standard airplane. It's got ailerons on the wings. It's got elevators on the tail. It flies like a conventional airplane. It's just that it's the it's the taking off and then the all important converting from being a helicopter into being an airplane. That's when you need the, the computer control to manage the foot, the, the thrust, and the and the forces and the directions and everything like that. So, Graham, I'm not a business executive, and I really don't need this, but I love the look of it. It reminds me of something that uh, Tony Stark from the Avengers would, would use as a personal <laughs> vehicle. Um, the question is, they're crowdsourcing or raising money here through the public. Do I need Tony Stark-like money to buy this thing? How much does it cost? Oh, it's going to be expensive. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, they're, they're not putting a, a, a price on it, but, I mean, to develop it, they acknowledged it's going to cost a couple hundred million plus to actually develop the airplane in the first place, and that's they've got to raise that money from pretty much all of that from conventional financing sources. But once it's built, you know, it's not going to be a cheap airplane. I mean, um, uh, business jets in this class at the moment probably cost, you know, somewhere between 10 and $15 million. So, I mean, it's not going to be any cheaper than that. Um, it's not a big airplane. It, it's in the same class as what we call a light business jet, which is a little like a Cessna Citation jet or something like that. It's got room for, a, it's flown by one pilot and then it has another five seats for passengers. It's not a big airplane, but it's about the size of what you'd expect an executive helicopter to be today, but it has a, it must, this much greater speed, altitude, smoothness, et cetera, et cetera. Unbelievable, man. Oh, well, I'm not a business person either, but I do need one. I also need uh, Leo to install a uh, helicopter pad on the roof and give me a million dollars to buy it, and I'll be but all don't, set. But don't forget that, that you know, if you're in the business jet market today, you can you can buy a share in an airplane, yeah. or you can get a card where you buy flight. You buy a card, and it, it, you, you, you use it to get flights. 
a lot of the market for a vehicle like this is not in somebody buying it for themselves. It's in, it's in an operator buying it and then flying it as a service to a broader audience. So this is something that doesn't exist at the moment. If they can develop this, there's a market there for somebody to operate these and to, in effect, you know, do almost, you could almost argue like a Uber service, but with a, with a, with a vertical takeoff and landing airplane, if they can develop it. That's a great point. Um, and, you know, shares are the way to go with this for most people. Of course, I'll predict that Sergey Brin is going to both back the Kickstarter and also be one of the first to fly one. Uh, because he's just that kind of guy, and this is just lunch money for him. Uh, Graham Warwick is at AviationWeek.com and is on the uh, on Twitter with the wonderful handle, The Warracle. Thank you so much for joining us today, Graham. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. A startup called Sensol is kickstarting a trackpad with some amazing abilities. It's called the Morph. It's about the size of an iPad mini, and what makes it different is that it has 20,000 pressure sensors embedded in the touchpad surface. It's so sensitive that it can even detect the lightly applied paintbrush, but I recommend you don't have paint on the paintbrush. Use a dry paintbrush. The Morph also has 10 add-on covers called overlays, which transport, uh, transform the pad into a keyboard, a DJ controller, a piano keyboard, a gamepad, and other interfaces. The company wants to raise $60,000, and they want to sell the Morph pads for $249 each, and those, of course, overlays are included in that price. Kevin Tofel, I really want one of these. This looks really cool. It does, and it actually speaks to how uh, not just that we've gotten used to touch devices, but how they're also advancing now. I mean, um, you know, we start out with multi-touch and then ten finger touch, and now we've got twenty thousand pressure sensors in this thing, and it can it can almost become anything. Uh, and, I, and I love that. I love the the fact that you can buy one device and use it for multiple purposes. So it's interesting to me. I don't know if uh, I'll have to see if it's worth two hundred fifty dollars for me, but uh, it's definitely appealing. And one of my obsessions is the future of, and I'm always harping on this, is the future of desktop computers. As I believe there'll be touch um, displays. People say, no, no, I need my keyboard and mouse. No, you won't, because the future will have this kind of touch sensitivity. If you imagine a, a big screen, big sheet of glass right in front of you with this kind of touch sensitivity, really great voice recognition. So you're not typing everything. You're not mousing and clicking everything. You just, a lot of it, your interaction is typing. But the idea to, instead of having overlays, just have a software thing pop up on the screen that can be a DJ, you know, you can do scratch records and, and that stuff. You can have a piano keyboard and, you know, full size, maybe piano keyboard or nearly so, uh, a regular typing keyboard or any interface you want with third-party app, apps providing that, the ability to brush on it, to use a pen and touch at the same time. I think people are going to be thrilled by the future of desktop computers if we can ever break the habit of this clunky contraption called the mouse and the keyboard. Keyboards, I think, are going to have a long life, but mice uh, should be gone forever. And I love this kind of innovation. Of course, this sort of, you know, this, this idea of embedding those kinds of sensors will just get cheaper and better over time. So I can't wait to try this, actually. Yeah, and Microsoft's not there yet, but they're already looking into this because earlier this week I saw a prototype of a what they call a display cover where they've actually put an e-ink display, a touchscreen e-ink display in a Surface tablet keyboard cover. And that e-ink uh, display will change to show uh, an email client or it might show your shortcuts or a quick button to the desktop. You can make it anything you want. So they're already thinking along those lines, obviously not to the uh, extent that your vision is, but I do agree with that. That's that's where we're heading. Yeah, absolutely. And we covered on the show yesterday, but you know, the thing that I think the the real, you know, I think the, what's really going to happen next in laptops is the bottom, instead of being a mechanical uh, touchpad and mechanical keyboard, is going to be another sheet of glass. And the, I was really blown away by the by the one laptop per child vision, which didn't quite get out there in the numbers that they hoped, but it was a two screen device that was clamshell. So you opened it out flat, and it was a big tablet. You bend it and hold it sideways and it was a book with two sides you hold it up as a laptop you you know it was so flexible and i think that's the great greatest model for a laptop going forward we just have to number one have better technology for on-screen keyboards and the like and number two get everybody in the in you know more happy and comfortable using on-screen keyboards as opposed to mechanical ones we love those clicky keyboards with key travel and all that kind of stuff but i think uh i think high resolution haptics will help uh, help satisfy us with the, our need for, to hear clicking and feel clicking. Well, a new study by the Pew Research Center found that norms around what's acceptable for smartphone use in public are changing fast. For example, in the United States, it's now broadly considered socially acceptable to use a smartphone while walking down the street or while on public transportation. About three-quarters of those surveyed said that's perfectly fine. 
but texting or talking at the dinner table or at church or in a mosque or wherever is still unacceptable. Most people who said it's not okay to use a smartphone at social gatherings did it anyway. So it's only unacceptable for other people. <laughs> That's the problem right there. 90% say they have always uh, always have their smartphones with them. In other news, 10% don't have their smartphones with them all the time. I don't know who those people are. And the acceptability of smartphone use, of course, varies greatly by age, with younger people feeling that it's more acceptable in more situations than older people feel it is. Uh, Kevin Tofel, this is uh, not surprising. We can feel the norms changing. I, I recall just a very few years ago when all kinds of situations were totally unacceptable for you to use a smartphone, and now it's pretty much acceptable. Yeah, it's definitely changing as the, the younger generation grows up with these devices becoming, you know, commonplace. They were always around in, throughout their entire lives. And I was laughing as you were reading this because I got in burn getting caught using my smartphone like at the Thanksgiving dinner table with the family all around me. And you can actually see the different generations of the family, what they expect in terms of social norms with smartphones versus, you know, say uh, the kids are like, yeah, I'm on my iPod touch. What, what, do, you, what do you want, grandma? You know, what? It's, it's, it's just interesting to, to see it from that perspective when yeah. you can have multi-generations. Right. And, oh, yeah, Uncle Bill, uh, sure, it's acceptable for me to give you tech support at Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> but not acceptable for me to use my iPad. Thanks a lot. Oh, man, brutal. Well, cars are getting really smart with car makers investing billions of dollars in new technology. But a new survey by J.D. Powers said half these features aren't even being used by most car owners. In fact, at least 20 percent of new vehicle owners have never used 16 of the 33 technology features specified in J.D. Powers 2015 Driver Interactive Vehicle Experience Report. The group most resistant to newfangled car tech is, wait for it, millennials with one in five saying they don't even want 23 of the 33 features in their cars at all. You know, we talk, We just did a story about how millennials are very happy to have their face in a smartphone at the dinner table, but they don't want tech, car technology, and I think it's the same reason. They want to just be in that phone. Which obviously, when you're driving, is is a no <laughs> yeah. a non issue. I mean, you yeah. can't you can't be doing that. Um, but it's it's amazing to me how complex the cars are really getting. I'm not surprised that most of the features aren't used. We've seen the same with smartphones. Uh, even recently, you could ask somebody, "Oh, do you use this feature, that feature?" And they're like, "I didn't even know my phone could do that." So um, it's always been a challenge when you're introducing new maturing technology, how do you get people aware and understanding what these devices are actually capable of? And the cars are getting smarter much quicker now. The chips are getting smaller and cheaper. Everything's getting embedded in and connected. And that's going to add complexity that people aren't even either aware of or don't want to deal with. Absolutely. And, and we covered a story, I think it was this week or earlier last week, uh, where we quoted Daimler CEO Dieter Zecchi, who said that he expects to do joint ventures and other sort of relationship things with companies like Apple and Google. And he kind of intimated that they are really in tune with user interfaces that the broad consumer marketplace uh, might be thrilled by. And I think to a certain extent, that's, a, that's an admission that the car industry has failed to produce on its own interfaces that people are, gonna, are using. And this J.D. Power uh, survey uh, backs that up. I think that's really the case. It's a lot like the TV industry or the remote controls or whatever. Most of the features for most of the complex interfaces that are presented to the public are not used. Uh, they're ignored. They, they, they overwhelm some people. And so I think that what we really need in cars is hyper simplicity and, and the kind of interface design that Apple does and that Google does and others do uh, in the tech industry. So just my two cents. Well, Etsy is an online marketplace for handmade stuff that you can order for delivery. But now, Etsy, the Etsy's iOS and Android apps, have a location-based feature that lets you find handmade products locally. The feature has been available in the past only on the company's website, but now it's kind of like Google Maps where you can say, okay, you know, it's like the, the, the broader version of antiquing. You can go on a road trip and go find handmade, handcraft stuff in your area uh, using a map, it'll give you directions, it'll give you store hours and all that kind of stuff. I think this is pretty great. Uh, Kevin Tofu, what do you think? Oh, I totally agree. Uh, I don't know how long it took them to get the location-based stuff into an app as opposed to just their website. But if you think about it, that's where it should be. It should be with you. And what's with you? Your phone. So if you're out and about, you're not sitting on a desktop computer saying, show me local goods that I can find through Etsy. You want to find it on your phone, your tablet. And I think this is fantastic. I think we should list uh, Tech News Today on, on Etsy because, of course, Jason and Anthony lovingly handcraft this show. Uh, you know, they do it 
the old-fashioned way with, with giant, love. expensive computers. Well, we got some more technology uh, news coming right up. But first, let's talk about Blue Apron. Let's talk about great food. You know, I love Blue Apron. And the reason for that is that it's a great way for me to feel like I know what I'm doing when I'm cooking. And uh, the results are always fantastic. Um, I like exotic food, and my taste in food is pretty wide-ranging. Uh, but but uh, Blue Apron does something that's really interesting. They give you uh, very well-engineered, if you will, uh, meals that are kind of exotic, but they're also crowd-pleasers. So if you think you don't like Ethiopian food, if you think you don't like certain types of exotic Asian foods, uh, the versions that Blue Apron will present to you are both authentic and also everybody's going to love them. I don't know how they do it, but they, they do use seasonal ingredients, fresh ingredients. You cook it yourself. This isn't, you know, they don't do anything for you except the shopping and the portioning. And the best part is their very brilliant step-by-step -step instructions, which take you through uh, and they hold your hand through the entire process, showing you high resolution photos of exactly what's going on at every point in the cooking process. You never get lost when you're cooking these things. You always know exactly what you're doing. And if you don't really fully understand how to do a certain uh, cooking process, uh, you can just uh, either use their app or go to their website and see these wonderful uh, educational videos. Don't watch cooking shows. You know, you should have your own cooking show right in your kitchen. Do your own cooking, and uh, Blue Apron will show you the way. Blue Apron is simply a better way to cook. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of tech news today, and I thank Blue Apron for making me look like I know what I'm doing. Got a big number for you today, 75 million. That's how many PCs have been upgraded with Windows 10 in the four weeks of its availability. The number was tweeted today by Microsoft's um, marketing chief, Yusuf Mehdi. And uh, that's an impressive number, Kevin Tofa. I think that compares very favorably with recent versions of Windows. Yeah, it's, it's a good number. Um, they've got a ways to go. Uh, I mean, there's probably a billion, last I heard, about a billion Windows users out there. And that's their goal is to get Windows 10 on a billion devices in a certain number of, of months or years. So it's a really good start. Um, it's, it's a big number in itself. But again, when you look at it, in, in, uh, relatively speaking, with the total number of Windows users, they've got some, some a ways to go yet. Um, I, I did my upgrade. It was a little challenging on a rather inexpensive netbook-like device. It took me about two days to get through it, but wow. uh, I'm I suspect most people are doing okay. And how do you like it? I do like it. I mean, it's it's finally the vision that Microsoft has been talking about for many years of, of bringing a, a true touch experience um, to the desktop that still works, that's familiar to mobile users and so on. So, so far, I do like it. Wonderful. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Kenny Pothier in Nova Scotia, who posted this picture on Facebook. He watches Tech News Today while repairing shoes at his company, Highland Shoe and Watch Repair. Very cool. I, I think it. I'm going to take my shoes up to Nova Scotia and get them <laughs> fixed there. It's my kind of guy. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup or your shoe repair facility. And post it on Instagram, Google+, Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Kevin Tofel. What the heck is going on? You hinted at a uh, car-related uh, bit of information before the show. What's what's the what's the deal with that? Well, I, I had traded in a vehicle just last night. I, I used to drive a 2013 Fiat C Abarth, a uh, fun mm. little performance car. And uh, after throwing it around the roads for two years, I traded it in last night, got myself a new car. And even though it didn't say it on the sticker... I found out this morning just by plugging in my phones that it supports both AirPlay and Android Auto. Mm. So that gives me something to do between uh, this show and next week's show and a couple more posts to write. So I'll be reviewing those uh, over at ZDNet. And if anybody can figure out how to run them both at the same time, <laughs> it's you. I'm counting on you, Kevin. Oh, I'm cramming Windows 7 on that thing. <laughs> it sounds good. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kevin Tofel. We'll see you next week. Great. Thanks, All right. Mike. All right. Bye-bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Stitcher, or you can choose some other way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how you can do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on the social media site of your choice, tag three friends, and recommend that they subscribe. 
You can join our Google Plus community. Just go to the community area on, on Google Plus and find Tech News Today. And you can follow me at Google, on elgin.com. That's my personal website. And follow me there. Don't miss our other new show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. Today's guest is Recode's Mark Bergen. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. The show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.